Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you here. Um, another Sabbath at the Seventh day Baptist Church of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, glad we all made it. I uh, hope uh, everyone who couldn't make it is doing well. But anyway, why don't we just let me open in prayer and then uh, we'll have a scripture reading. No, we'll have a hymn, then a scripture reading, and so forth and so on. Anyway, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, well, everything, <laughs> for you being who you are and, and, and for you doing what you do and for giving us uh, your son to pay you know, the ransom for our eternal lives. And it just Thank you for giving us each other to uh, minister to one another here on earth and to go out and, and uh, you know, preach your word just out of love for you. Anyway, I'd just uh, like to ask you, first of all, to please be with uh, a couple of the people uh, that couldn't make it here today. Jay and Linda, please, you know, put your hand of healing on them. Help them get better so that, you know, we can see them next week or as soon as possible. I'd like to ask you to keep everyone who else is not here, keep them safe and in your sight. And I'd just like to ask you to come here among us today and uh, your Holy Spirit and just fill us with your love and uh, let us worship you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I guess the first hymn is, who's doing hymns? Oh, you are? It's you or her? Okay. Hymn, Let All Things Now Living. Everybody. Today, our scripture reading is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you for bringing us together. I pray that you would be with us, give us eyes to see what you want us to see and ears to hear what you want us to hear. Be with me, Lynn. Let everything go according to your will. Be with those who couldn't be with us today. Keep everybody happy and healthy, if that's according to your will. And please put your healing hands on all of those who we love and those that we do not know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So I remember when um, right, right after Pastor Daryl was gone, we were just shortly after that we were talking about you know who, who's going to be doing scripture reading is this getting feedback anybody hearing any feedback okay um and uh we were talking about you know who is going to do the uh, sermons and when and you know we three of us would rotate and and one of the three of us mentioned, you know, that, well, you know, when we were talking about what style of sermon, you know, we all do. And he said, you know, the one thing I just don't like is when someone steps up to the pulpit and basically does a book report. And I heartily agreed. I said, yeah, that's it. Uh, so it's kind of ironic. And I'm standing here holding a book that I'm going to talk about. And it's called Unearth the Church. And it's by a fellow, someone called John Mark Kaminga, which I think most of you over on this side know him personally, probably. I'm not sure if I've met him or not. 
but he's a Seventh-day Baptist pastor in uh, West Virginia. And uh, I, I found out, he, you know, he has published his book, so I got it, and I started reading, and I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm liking this, you know. I, I don't know what any of the other of you, you know, what you know about John Mark, you know, or whether you agree with, most of his, you know, theology or whatever, but I was liking this. And I decided, I'm going to do my next sermon about this. <laughs> so here I am, pulling the book up. But, you know, I'm not just going to, not just going to page through and you know, go to each tab I put in there, but I will also do that, although I probably won't get to all of them. But first, I wanted to tell you a, a story, a true story, uh, about an experience I had uh, when I was uh, pastoring a church in Lake uh, Elsinore, California for a short time. And I went to a con uh, pastor's conference that year. And I tried to remember the name of the guy that had been asked to come and speak there at the pastor's conference. Um, he was not a Seventh-day Baptist, but he, I don't remember if he had written, I think he had written some books about, uh, basically about, uh, not so much about church growth, but about, the phases churches go and go through, and 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 he had specifically been asked to speak about the end phases of churches as they mature, and you know once they were thriving, and then the people start moving away, and you're ending up with just a, a few people who are there that you know are usually elderly, and, and no one's showing up anymore, and. Uh, I can't remember. I don't think his name was uh, Henry Blackaby. But I, I don't know if you might have heard of Henry Blackaby. But he, I think he was referencing one of his books a lot. But while he was there, he recounted an experience he had had not too long before that where he was, I think, in, in Europe somewhere, I think in Greece doing research, and he was having dinner uh, with uh, a bunch of uh, Greek Orthodox bishops. And he said they were just, oh, they look fantastic. You know, their beautiful vestments and their gold chains and crosses and the rings and everything. They just, you know, and they were telling them about you know, their churches and stuff. And at one point, he finally realized, uh, I, I don't remember, I, I won't probably get the exact churches right, but I mean, I think you'll see why that's not really important. But he, he realized he was sitting across from and talking a lot to the Bishop of Ephesus. And then on his right and left were like the Bishop of Laodicea. And I don't remember which one, like I said. One of the other churches, the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation, where God goes through and he talks about, you know, you know, you know, most of them he said, Well, they're doing some things really right there. And it Praise them for that, encourage them, and he said, but I have this against you. And he would talk about, okay, this you need to work on. And uh, just for the record, there are no churches, Christian churches in those towns. <laughs> there haven't been for hundreds of years. They were conquered by, uh, uh, I, I 
remember my history, but ultimately they were conquered by the Ottoman Empire. And they basically persecuted them out. The only thing there now is ruins. And maybe a you know, modern city built up around it. But those, the office of that church still existed. And had been, and he didn't know what they did. He, they didn't have a congregation. But he just kind of thought, well, that's, that is kind of telling that uh, churches can end up like that, where they're just basically not even a shell of them. They're once glorious selves. They just exist only in name only. And the reason they had asked this guy to come speak there, because at that point, in a, you know, it's like 25, 30 years ago. And we were starting to really look at ourselves as a denomination because we had a lot of churches you know we we were overall we were shrinking in membership and some occasionally a church would shut down and then there were churches that you know did only have a couple you know you know a handful of elderly people that and there weren't going to be any more after them And one of the things that he focused on, as I recall, was John Mark, what John Mark Camiga focuses on in his book, and that's not how to grow the church. And he, he, he made the case, you know, you leave that up to God. What you want to do is live in obedience, loving obedience to Christ and basically fulfill the Great Commission. Go out and make disciples you know, throughout the whole world, you know, starting at home, of course, but, you know, the end of you, you, you do that by going out or reaching out and being a blessing to the world around you. And then God, God will decide who to bring in for you to, to disciple. And you could do discipling with people you know, out in the your mission field who aren't even members of your church and never will be. Just show them the love of Christ. Anyway. So that's mainly what John Mark Kaminga talks about in his book. And uh, he starts out by acknowledging where we are. I think, from what I've heard, we're a little better off than we were like then. We're, then we were like, I think, pretty well under 10,000 members of our denomination. Now we're supposedly back up to that, and we're opening more churches. We're still you know, some are still shutting down once in a while, but we seem like we might be starting to rebound. But we still do have certain issues, certain certain phenomena that really they don't really apply to us yet because. We just started. We haven't built up to a thriving congregation yet. But a lot of their churches are churches that have, that are not still growing. You know, he said, you can look out and, and uh, you can see that the parking lots and the pews just are a lot emptier than they used to be. And, and this is basically true of all churches. Because uh, a Christian church is declining in America, still declining. But there aren't as, aren't that many uh, eighteen to thirty four year olds. It said like about fourteen percent is the average most churches. There are lots of folks in the sixty five plus range in the church, like forty some percent usually. Pastors are getting older, an average of fifty seven years. And here's the ones that 
struck me because these weren't statistical uh, observations. Uh, not all of them were statistical observations. You know, polling members of the church, but fifty. Two percent of the non-church believe pastors aren't trustworthy. Forty-four percent of millennials believe the church is judgmental. More than half of millennials believe the church is detached. And so there, it kind of defines the mission field there. And uh, starts, he, he divides up our, this, this, this book is basically to help us figure out where we are, where we ought to be, what we should do. He doesn't, one of the things I like about this book, he doesn't give that many answers. He gives us questions and gives us ideas, you know, what to look at. And he kind of divides it up into uh, the two major parts are, okay, first go outside the church and look in from the viewpoint of the people outside the church. Then bring that back into the church and get, have a good hard look at where we are and look out. And get to my next one. It says, okay, when you go outside, in both cases, we're going to be doing some stuff that's kind of hard. We're going to have a real critical look at ourselves. And, you know, for a while when I was reading this book, I thought, well, that's starting to sound like a bummer. Then I saw it, okay. But he said part of the, the first part of that looking at ourselves is looking at what, what we're doing right. So I thought, okay, well, that's, so we're up, up, that's going to be uplifting, you know, to, you know, notice the things that we're doing well. And that'll make it a little more palatable for us to then turn and say, okay, but are we not doing well? Some of the questions he said we need to answer are, what does the mission of your church appear to be outside of our observers? You know, are you... You can, as you consider your perspective on your church, what do you think the church is communicating to them out there? And he asked rhetorically, are you willing to consider perspectives of those outside the church as potential sources of truth about your church's ministry, witness, and reputation? Now, in some ways, for Seventh-day Baptists, it might be an exercise of going out and asking people, okay, what do you think of us Seventh-day Baptists down the street here? And they'll go, who? Like, no one's even heard of us. But that's valuable information, too. You know, are we getting out into the mission field and, and making ourselves a blessing. And I, I know in this church, we're trying. You know, we just had that praise and play event and didn't go off like we thought it would. But we kind of started, you know, took that and made the most of it and started with ourselves. Say, okay, well, then we will use this event. Basically, fellowship with one another to do. You know, it was, and it was a great blessing, I think. Not just for the grown ups to have fellowship with each other, but just to see the children of our congregations. They're just 
enjoying themselves being at church. He also has uh, three categories of, uh, I guess you could say, he says, because of the objects of it and, and that evangelistic work. But, you know, not objects, it's people. Those who have never heard of Jesus, I don't think there's that many, have never heard anything about Jesus, but there a lot of people out there that have just heard things that are not not even true about Jesus. Those who have heard about Jesus and rejected him and those who have come to know Jesus and have walked away from him. And he thinks we should concentrate mostly on that last one. And uh, we should ask ourselves, Why, why that we should ask them why they have left. And, you know, some of them, it is, we all know people whose life circumstances changed and they had to move somewhere maybe that where there are no Seventh-day Baptist churches. But a lot of them might not be going to church anymore. We've had COVID that we haven't recovered from that. But then we get to Many have left because questions or doubts were dismissed. And many have left because of the trauma or hurt they experienced. And those last two are the ones we need to concentrate on. And I can tell you a little story about the first one. Uh, he, he mentioned in this book uh, about a young girl, high school girl, he called Angela. And, you know, she was... He was going to church, but you know, as you know, as kids start growing up, they start asking questions and they want to know answers. And uh, in her case, she didn't get answers; she get, kind of got rebuffed for, you know, not just not just not having enough faith. And uh, that's something that kind of, for a while, I let keep me out of the church. I remember in high school, I was I was dating a girl who was, she was a Christian, so I went with her to things like I think they call it is it campus life or campus crusade for life, the high school version of it, and we would go to the visit different churches in the area, some in our hometown, some up in Denver, and like on two or three occasions, I you know, like uh, I, I remember uh, at the place up in Denver. The guy gave a presentation and said, anyone who has any doubts, misgivings, come and talk to me afterwards. He invited us to come ask questions. So I did. And I asked the big question on my mind is, you know, like, we well, were giving us all this teaching out of the Bible, but how do we know this is truth? And he kind of looked taken aback that anyone actually would take him up on that opportunity to ask him some hard questions and uh, you know I was just talking to him I wasn't wasn't in front of the whole group they had moved on to snacks or whatever and all he would tell me is well you, if you just pray about it God will give you the, the assurance that it is true he didn't give me any evidence talk about anything like that. Another time uh, in, our, in our hometown, the church that sponsored uh, this youth group, they had some itinerant, he was kind of a hippie preacher, looked pretty rough. You know, later I, I got to thinking, you know, when Charles Manson became famous, I thought, that guy looked like him. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't know. But he did a big presentation out of the Gospel of John. And, and he did the same thing. He asked people to come up and ask questions. And I came up and asked him. Uh, well, this is great. But, I mean, 
how do I know this is, you know, accurate? I don't know it's true. It's historical. And he kind of got on my case, you know, started to get kind of scary. And the sponsor of the youth group kind of dragged me away from him after a while because he was like, all I can tell you is just read this again and just pray about it and you'll know. <laughs> so we have to be aware of that. I don't think we have to worry about that in this church. Because some of us are into, you know, finding the answers to the hard questions. But what we do have to worry about, and we still have to take into consideration is how other churches have treated people. And, and John Mark makes the point here, other churches' misdeeds are technically our misdeeds too, even if we're not the one that committed them. Because we are all one church. And their experience with Christianity has been what it is. And we have to address it. Anyway, I better try to hurry here or you'll be here the rest of your lives. I always worried that this is going to go too fast. I wish I should have known better. I don't ever. So that's one issue. And we uh, take, you know, what we learn from people that looking in at us bring it into ourselves and now ask us those same hard questions about ourselves. And this could get a little dicey. I thought, you know, like, people get defensive. I mean, even if it's not personally about them, it's about our church. But he also tells us we need to look into our own hearts, and that's hard. You know, how do the, you know, when I look and see, you know, like, yeah, in my own life, have I hurt people? And I had to, you know, I, I was able to, I was taken aback about, about how easy it was for me to think of ways that I, you know, even if it was unintentional, I did. I was not there for my brothers and sisters in the church. And I, I mean, in a couple cases where they left the church. I mean, I didn't chase them out or anything. I won't take responsibility for that, but I wasn't really there for them the way I should have been. And I've had that happen to me. So, when it happens, we've got to look at it. The one thing, you know, we've got to keep in mind, the whole time we're looking at what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, is keep Holding it up against what Christ has called us to do, which is the Great Commission. Because we can get distracted. And I think for us, one concern, and I think is a legitimate concern, is that, you know, if we want to be able to minister to one another and disciple one another and to minister to and disciple people in our mission field, we need to exist. So we got to start, you know, it's natural that we got to start thinking about church growth. And yeah, we're going to need to do some things to address that, but it can't be our main focus. I think if we make our main focus discipling one another and discipling people in the mission field. Be a blessing to one another. Be a blessing to the people in the mission field. It will take care of itself. So. Like I said, I'm not going to have time to address all of these. Later chapters are just kind of how he wraps things up anyway, but I did want to share one thing with you. 
before I I wrap up my sermon. And I see I've been going long enough. So let me do that. And I wanted to share with you something I read recently. In, um, on a website. With kind of a dorky name. It's called Art of Manliness. Uh, I think uh, James Dobson figured out back in the 70s, you know, when people were talking about, you know, well, we've got to help out girls. Girls are just marginalized and this and that. And he said, no, they aren't. This is their time. Boys are being marginalized. And, and it's been that way ever since. Men are marginalized. We're almost obsoleted in some ways. And this website is kind of uh, geared towards addressing that. You know, so it's the art of manliness. You know, I'm gonna, it sounds a little dorky. So yeah, I'm going to make being manly an art. But, but it's good. And if I would just hurry up and find it. No, I saved it here. There, there we go. And this is a uh, an excerpt from a book uh, called "The Emerging Revival." It was published in 1946. And I had to go online and say, oh, what? Really? There was a revival starting in 1946? So I had to order this book. And it was used. It was the 1946 edition. So I ordered it. It was cheap. So I ordered it, even though I'm unemployed you know, right now. But I had to have that book. And I'm glad I did because I went back and looked at it again after I ordered it. And said, oh, this is no longer available. I ordered the last one. But uh, it's the Merging Revival, and it's a, a short, like one paragraph essay. There is always time for heroism. And it's uh, about a man named Wendell Phillips. And I had looked that up, and he was a, actually, he lived in the 1800s. He was uh, an abolitionist. He had been uh, trained as a lawyer. Uh, he graduated, started a law practice. Found himself a wife, got married, did the thing a man is supposed to do that, well, I think all the other men in our congregation have done that except me, but you know, I won't go into why. But, but uh, his wife thought, you know, you, you should really do this full time, this abolitionist stuff. So eventually he gave up his law practice so he could devote himself full time being an abolitionist and he spent his life that way and he lived long enough to see the abolition of slavery died in like 1894 or something like that so anyway this story is about an evening a young a much younger man spent chatting with the guy and like i said the name of this one is this essay is, there is always time for heroism. Once Wendell Phillips and a young friend were sitting by the fire. It was a memorable evening. Recollections had flushed the cheeks of the veteran campaigner. Memory of former heroic days had loosened his tongue. He had completely lost himself in the thrilling recital of the past. The young visitor sat enthralled. At last, when he recognized that the evening was far gone, he rose with a start. Mr. Phillips, he exclaimed, as he grasped the older man's hand. If I had lived in your time, I think I would have been heroic too. A veteran who had accompanying, had accompanied his young visitor to the door was noticeably aroused. 
As he pointed down the street, he drew the attention of his companion to flaunting indications of audacious vice. His voice was tremulous with indignation as he exclaimed, Young man, you are living in my time and in God's time. Be sure of this. No man could have been heroic then who is not heroic now. And that really struck me. I think I've mentioned to some of you guys some of the uh, some of the flaunting indications of audacious vice I've seen in this neighborhood between here and the neighborhood we're moving to. The world is in a desperate state and it's getting worse. And we need to be heroic because our witness, our discipleship, our ministry is desperately needed to give people some hope. And I see the world out there, you know, discouraged, you know, they've lost touch with our own history they're they're in a state of despair so and that's one of the reasons that this book caught my attention because you know I don't know if it's the way we need to get busy and get out there and start ministering to people, but it's a way we could. It's a, a one way that we could start going through and inventorying what we're doing right, what we need to do, how we need to change, and looking into our own hearts. And I just want to encourage everybody to do that so that we can get out into the world and do it not because will bring more members in, or even because we know that we will get through to a lot of people and change their lives. That's not up to us. That's God's. That's God's purview. We need to get out there and, and minister to the world and to one another out of love for Christ. Just love for Christ because he loved us. Anyway, we have one more hymn. I'll do a benediction and we can go do what I think we have a pretty good start of doing right. And that's our fellowship with each other. So let's do that. Okay. By the way, that when uh, Esther Steve was putting together the bulletin for us, I appreciate him. appreciate him and Linda and everybody doing that for us. He he asked me. Uh, he texted me and said, "Okay, I want to make sure I got the song." So the last one is uh, that Christmas song. And I was like, "I guess it. Yeah, it is. It's a Christmas song." I didn't really thought about. It. I thought it was an old spiritual. But the reason it's in there is because uh, when I was Searching for songs, and I, I googled, you know, hymns about the Great Commission. This popped up on a couple lists, so it's telling us to go tell on the mountain, which is anyway. So let's pray and then let's go fellowship. Lord, we thank you so much that you loved us enough to pay the price for our sins so that we could be with you forever and enjoy your fellowship with us forever we thank you for using us to do your work in this world 
We thank you for giving us this great commission, telling us to go tell it on the mountain, on the hills and everywhere. Please be with us while we do that, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen.